You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Victor, and joining me is William, the wonderful, the one and only, your friend and mine and friend to all mankind, Gallagher. Okay, just unpacking that. But all right, that's very nice. Hello. Hi to you two. You completely adequate, Victor. How's that then? Ouch. I'm, I'm out of practice with this. Ah, well, now I know what you think of me. Anyway, <laughs> okay, you and sorry. all the listeners, it's all right. It's okay. Now, in the last week or so, we were talking about how Google and, and uh, Facebook We were talking about how Google and Facebook had completely abused their developer certificates and were using them to distribute applications to people outside of their organizations that were not employees. And, and basically, that's that's an abuse of the rules. But there, don't you mean previously on Apple Insider Podcast, Google and Facebook do? Oh, sorry, yes, carry on. Yeah. I take it the story continues. Well, it does, and it continues because TechCrunch is doing some massively good reporting. TechCrunch revealed that there are numerous apps that have sidestepped these approvals processes going through the Enterprise Certificate Program. All right. And these applications offer services from, let's say, adult content <clears throat> to gambling. Okay. And because they're distributing through the Enterprise Certificate Program, they don't have to comply with App Store rules, which would have instantly rejected them. But presumably they have to qualify to get enterprise certificate thing. I mean, I, I've told you before, I'm a developer. I, I don't know what you need to be enterprise level on because I don't need it. So I've never looked. But, you know, they needed my bank account details and things well, to prove I was who I was. So here's here's how it works, right? You can set up the enterprise certificate with genuine data. Mm -hmm. But some of these entities are going further and using the, the process to hide their identity by using the details of another firm. So right. the way that it works is that, um, you know, you, you have to have a business address. You have yes. to have a Dunn's ID number, which is a, a, a Dunn and Bradstreet number, basically. It's, it's just a number that is used to certify that you are, in fact, a business. And... Well, presumably you need that for this, the enterprise version. I, um, I'm in a different country. Yeah, yeah. So no, no. I'm saying here, as as the enterprise version, this is the that. details that are required, yeah. right? So yeah. you you get your your DUNs DUNS number, right? Your Dun and Bradstreet number, your Google business address, and you know you you go ahead and put those into the form, and for all the world are just basically looking like a legitimate company. And so, so far, there have been 12 <clears throat> adult content applications and 12 real money gambling applications using the enterprise certificate that are able to be installed on a standard non-jailbroken iPhone. Both of those kinds of forms of apps are banned under the App Store guidelines. Now, the, there are some other apps that I found that, that were also doing this that are being used to distribute movies that aren't legitimate or would not have otherwise been allowed on the App Store. Um, so just video files, for, and I say just, I mean, not actually even apps. Well, I mean, if you wanted to, to let's, let's, let me read what their site said, because I found this. We make free app for iOS and Android to stream video content directly in app and television. Many features await you to explore. Safe, simple, easy to use. I know that that right there sounds awesome to you. But it's uh, over ton movies, TV shows for free. Always update the latest movies. Free to watch offline. You will have great travels with us without internet. So it is it is a free movie and TV distribution scheme. Okay. Well, I'm currently uh, three weeks behind on Star Trek Discovery on Netflix. So uh, I I'm not going to rush out to try to add more. But no, I no, can no, see how just, that would be, be done. You can see how that might be violating the sorts of things that Apple would normally approve in an app store, right? They would not approve oh, yes. this application. Um, so it's going on and is far more common than we thought. And this is troubling. Uh, is Apple doing anything about it? Do we know? Well, Apple refused to explain how these apps slipped into the enterprise certificate prep program. And they declined to say if they do any follow-up compliance audits on developers in the program, or if they plan to change the admission process. Um, they hmm. have indicated that they are going to work to shut down these applications and potentially ban the developers from building iOS products entirely. 
their statement was that developers that abuse our enterprise certificates are in violation of the Apple Developer Enterprise Program Agreement and will have their certificates terminated, and if appropriate, they will be removed from our developer program completely. We are continuously evaluating the cases of misuse and are prepared to take immediate action. Okay, I suppose they would say that. Uh, what else could you say for it? To I mean, they're not going to gonna say, hey, man, it's cool. <laughs> Yeah, whatevs. <laughs> you know, I can't really see. Hey, they Tim paid Cook. for their developer program by God. They can do what they want. Yeah, Tim Cook standing up at a keynote uh, saying, you know, if adults want to do this, if they want to gamble and they're willing to go through side loading or whatever, well, that's their choice. Can't see that happening either. No. No. But, and and okay. you can bet, I mean, every year we'd sort of do a WWDC bingo, right? The Worldwide Developer <laughs> Conference bingo. Yes. Yes. Not putting in a square there is is Tim Cook congratulates developers of of enterprise certificates for how many apps they've gone ahead and distributed to people. Right. Uh, good morning, he'll say, and fifty million films illegally downloaded through iPhone, which is ninety percent more than through Android or something like that. OB. Yeah. Oh, now to, to, to lay Android. this out, right? There, we said that they were people were using certificates belonging to other businesses. So there's an app that is an adult content app that uses the enterprise certificate registered to a cabinet and furniture company. Oh, hang on. Does that cabinet company actually have its own app? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Actually, that this suddenly really troubles me because I mean I do think there's an element that if it's like if you want a jailbreak, well, you know, I'm I'm not your mummy and daddy, off you pop, do what you do. But also, if this is actually the case that legitimate companies will have their legitimate apps switched off because someone is using their ID, then that that's a huge other thing as well. And I don't even know how Apple would police that if two people are using the same thing. That's really interesting. I am just searching the App Store right now to see if there's anything at all. Um, there are applications that, that would fit the definition of this kind of thing, but I it's it's not clear at all that they're actually – no, they're not from that company. So, yeah, they're, it's just they've gone ahead and used this furniture company's information to make their right. enterprise okay. certificate. So, uh, it's identity theft, corporate style. Um which is hey, obviously bad. In, in America, a unique twist of, of the way things work is that corporations are sort of persons. Yes, legal entities are individuals. And yeah. I don't understand why or how, but I, I saw it, that it, on an it, episode of Suits once. It, it stems from the late 1800s and the railroad barons. Yeah, okay. Well, they didn't mention that. I get all my uh, legal information from TV shows. I think I might be being foolish there, but, you know, well-rounded education. Uh, as long as you aren't actually practicing, you're probably okay. Oh? I mean, you know, you can you can have as much information as you like as long as you aren't giving bad advice to other people, right? Okay. Right. Slightly worried there. Just going through my Tons and list. tons of people. In tons of people in in your government, for example, go around completely <laughs> misinformed all day long. Right. And as long as they um, aren't passing legislation, they haven't harmed anyone but themselves. Yeah, just the fate of the country. I'm being um, terrible. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how well known this is outside the UK, but we did have a famous incident here of a government minister saying, well, I think people are fed up of listening to experts about things. A guy called Michael Gove is just... That's know. that's a sort of common opinion uh, in the United States as well, especially when people talk about it? things like climate change. You know, what do those scientists know anyway? Right. Well, let's just despair about this. Yeah. For a bit. We're going to have a good cry after this episode. After? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, after you and I talk, I'm off to a poetry festival. I will calm down. Like I said, a good cry. Now poetry <laughs> festival. Okay. Yeah. This is a continuing problem, and the the balance is how far should companies have to go to prove that they're a company in order to be able to to do enterprise yeah. applications, and what sort of requirements should be in place, and what sort of audits should be in place. It's it's a difficult line to walk. Do you know it is? But also, I've just realised you're the man to tell me something. Um, 
Uh, as I just said, I'm a developer. So today, um, as we record this, I got an email from Apple saying I've got to add uh, two-step authentication to my developer account. And, and I'll be honest with you, I just thought, yeah, yeah, I'll read it later, whatever. So I know nothing more than that headline on the email, except uh, I feel like I'm hearing people ranting in the distance. Um, what's the problem? What am I going to find when I finally read the rest of the email? Well, so the difficulty is that it's – it's um, we, we, we have all these different accounts, right? We have yeah. accounts for iCloud. We have accounts for the App Store and we have accounts for developers. And all of these three different things are separate and they're stored separately at Apple. They cannot be merged at Apple either or at least they have not been merged at Apple because they, mm -hmm. they came about separately. Yes, I've ended up with multiple things for multiple reasons. I even have US and UK iTunes store accounts, and that that really I do as well confuses me sometimes. But yeah. it's terribly handy. It, it can be, uh, you know, especially if you're trying to load, you know, iPlayer or or iTV or any of these apps that aren't actually available on the American App Store. But the the difficulty is that when they start doing this two factor stuff, that they want it to be email address based. And you know some of some of these accounts don't even have emails associated with them. Really? Um, I yes, to really, because email. well, but you have to remember that that some of them were allowed to be created without email originally. Okay, I didn't know that. And that... so now trying to set them up means trying to go ahead and tack an email onto them. But if that email that you've got is already in use with something else, it's it's just a big nightmare. Basically, this is one of those areas where Apple is weak on services once again. You know, some of us have iCloud addresses that have me.com, and so you can't even change the primary on that kind of thing. Whereas if you had a newer one that was an iCloud.com, you can. So it's uh, it's sort of all over the place. And there are people that are saying, you know, they hope that Apple will let them do two-factor using SMS. And my concern there is that two-factor with SMS is inherently dangerous as well. I was having a lovely time. Okay, right. Do you want uh, to go on and explain that one really quickly? Yes, please, because okay. I've heard it, but I, I don't know why. So here's mm. what happens. What do you do if you've lost your phone? Mm. You ask mm. your provider to go ahead and and set you up with another SIM card. Yes. Right? And you can go ahead and get them to, to assign your number to a fresh SIM card. Oh, okay, yes. And so... so if you happened to go and and pick up a SIM card for that carrier at the store and mm -hmm. ring them up and tell them, hey, I'm William and I've lost my SIM, my phone. I, I went and picked up a fresh SIM card from the store, you know, one of those pay-as-you-go models. Can you go ahead and port my number onto that SIM? Here's the SIM card's details. And they, they ask you a few questions, and sure enough, they think you're William Gallagher, and they go ahead and port your number over. Now you can put that SIM card, and you've hijacked that person's phone. Then you start going ahead and signing into services and doing the lost password reset, and it says, oh, I need two-factor. And it goes ahead and sends it to the SMS, and now you've got the two-factor. Okay. Okay. And yes. it may sound far-fetched to you and to our listeners, but I know people who have suffered this vulnerability. I know someone who got off an airplane, turned on their phone, and their phone service didn't work. And as soon as they got on Wi-Fi, they saw all of the things coming into their email from password resets. Wow. And there was nothing they could do to stop it because AT&T had gone ahead and handed over their number yeah. to the attacker who then had their SMS and was then able to get into the email and reset the email password because they had the recovery phone number. Right. Okay. Can so. you can you imagine, right? You you do this and you start seeing the emails come through and then you stop seeing the emails come through and then you can't get an email at all because the password's been reset because the password reset got sent to the recovery phone number which was your cell phone. Yes, I can imagine and now I think I'm not going to be able to stop imagining. So, yeah. right, glad I asked you. That. Yeah, don't use okay. don't use SMS for two-factor authentication for anything. Okay, I seem to be committed to using it to an awful lot of things, but... Huh, right, so uh, where does that leave me with the developer account? Sorry, I'm asking you about developer accounts, and how many people are actually developers? How many of us are going to be even a little bit bothered? Well, by as Worldwide Developer Conference will tell you, they have loads of developers, right? right? 
Th- Ooh, this can is I a go problem. to WWDC? Can I, am I eligible to get into whatever it is? You have pick, to win the ticket gonna... lottery to do it, but yeah. Okay. Now, right. by the way, you can go even if you don't, but you won't get into WWDC. But there are tons of of alternate events around it that other developers have put together so that even if you don't have a ticket, you can go ahead and and have the communal experience and the learning experience through these alternate sessions. Yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to travel from the UK to uh, California to just basically look over the wall at Apple. Um, well, no, 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 no. you're making a mistake. It's not looking over the wall. There's, there for years the have been separate parties and separate uh, separate sessions that are still very, very advantageous, and you would be in the company of some of the best developers. Might just do one here in the UK instead. Why not? I a viewing party. think we should start a WWDC in the UK. All right, then. Okay. It's not going to happen, but let's just go yay. Okay. Well, there there <laughs> were alt conferences um, that were over on, on that side of the pond. There was one in Ireland for a few years that I'm blanking uh-huh. on the name of. Nothing prevents anyone from starting a conference. You just have to go to the work of getting people to attend, putting together okay. talks and sessions and, you know, rent a hotel ballroom and have some space or held a conference room and have some space and give it up, maybe put it on. A hotel ballroom? Oh, we want more than that. We want ships. We want there, aircraft there carriers. Have been, there have been nerd cruises where people have done developer parties and developer sessions and learning sessions on cruises. Well, actually, I know that because I, I can't tell this story. Can I tell this story? A friend uh, who's a writer used to be an actor on a, a, a really mm. big show in the UK, and she got uh, hired to go on a cruise uh, with one of her colleagues and talk about the show and things, and said it's the worst two weeks of her career. It was just absolutely foul. Two her weeks? C- no. God, goes back no. and forth all over the place. I think I may be exaggerating a little bit, but apparently her co-star was drunk solidly all the way through and it was hell so uh, i have a different image of this but no, no. given that i cannot tell you what the show is um let's just stop there and and, and move on is there anything else happening i mean if you were going to do a if you were going to do a nerd cruise like that you'd want it to be short and sweet you want like two days max victor you're thinking about this far too much you okay. you, you want a cruise like this uh, I see you as a Stargate kind of cruiser, but there we go. Yes. Right. All right. Okay. So um, I think we would... Uh, God, so we were talking blank. all about developers and two-factor authentication. Yeah, I think we'd finish that. You, you've explained so. to me enough to panic me. Is there anything left to say No, but, that? but panic is the right emotion there. You should absolutely okay. be panicked. Excellent. Well, you know, I was getting far too relaxed, what with Brexit and things. Nice to have a bit of bit of extra panic in your world. Keeps the blood going. And know? speaking of panicking, with all the news about online security breaches, it's hard not to worry about where your data goes, right? Making an online purchase or simply accessing your email could put your private information at risk. You're being tracked online by social media sites, marketing companies, and your mobile or internet provider. And we're going to come to that in just a moment, actually, because we've got a story about that as well. Not only can they record your browsing history, but they often sell it to other corporations who want to profit from your information. And and that's why it's so important to use a VPN service. That's why I have decided to use ExpressVPN. Now, ExpressVPN has easy-to-use apps that run seamlessly in the background on the computer, phone, and tablet. And turning it on only takes one click or tap. And it secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. Protecting yourself with ExpressVPN costs less than $7 a month. And they have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you use public Wi-Fi at all and you want to keep hackers and spies from seeing your data, ExpressVPN is the solution. And if you don't want to hand over your online history to your internet provider, ExpressVPN is a good answer. So protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash Apple Insider. That's expressvpn.com slash Apple Insider for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash Apple Insider to learn more. What large company purchased a Wi-Fi router product that might want to snoop on your data, do you suppose? Uh, Whoever could it be, William? I just don't know. Begin with A and end in Mizun, by any chance? I actually wrote about this for Apple Insider about how uh, Amazon could be doing this, but I realized, actually, I've never used it because I'm in the UK, and as far as I know, they've not been available here. You're really familiar with how these things work. I have had... 
both versions of, of this router, InfraTest. The first version of Eero, E-E-R-O, was a three-unit router system, mesh Wi-Fi, and originally all three units were identical. That is, they all had it was the same hardware, and it was just the first one you plugged in became the master, the, the main unit, and all of the others became clone units, let's say. And <clears throat> actually, sorry, can you back up for a second? I understand the word mesh. I get kind of the idea that it makes your Wi Fi better, but I don't understand why, I, why is it as good as everybody says? What does it do for you? All right. So. Suppose you have a residence in which you have bad areas for Wi-Fi. Yes, I do. I am. Yes. Okay. And so in the past, there have been attempts to try and fix those with what we've called extenders. Mm, and I've an extender extender is a device where you, you plug it in within range of the first one, and then it has a second antenna that rebroadcasts out to all of your client devices in the areas that were bad. The problem with an extender is that it really only has the one radio in it. And so it divides its time between talking back to the main unit, the internet, and then talking to the clients. So effectively, your bandwidth is half what it should be. Oh, I see. That explains a lot. Okay. All right. Uh, but not when you have an Eero thingy, right? Right. So, so the best mesh Wi-Fi systems are ones that have three radios, where what they're doing is they have the 5 gigahertz and the 2.4 gigahertz for client, and then they'll have another 2.4 or 5 gigahertz in there solely for back channel, solely for maintaining the back and forth between the main unit. They don't have to, to split their time. Okay, that's clever. And so what happens that's really cool is that's, that's fine if you just have two units, right? But if you start piling on more units, then they intelligently use that back channel to communicate between all three of them so that you have a true mesh. All right, okay. And you can go in four uh, and five and up to 15 units in some of these cases. But the truth is that for most residences, three units is probably enough, you know, unless you've got some gargantuan mansion and are living a life of luxury and ease and, and need more Wi-Fi, you probably can be fine with just the three units. Or rather, you could have been. But now it's the end of an era, isn't it? Sorry, oh, I just thought of that. Oh, I just thought of that. Oh. I had to say it. Um, Amazon has bought them. Uh, that's got to be a good thing, isn't it? More people will have heard of this. More people will find out about it. Yay. Well, and potentially maybe the costs will drop. Maybe the device will become oh, lower yeah. priced. So they, they'd sold the, – that was the original Eero version I was talking about. Then they came along with a second version right. where they kept the main unit about the same, but the client units changed shape and lost some of their Ethernet ports. And oh, okay. So what that meant is that, you know, you in the original system, you could do wired backhaul, which is even better, right? If you have Ethernet in your walls, then you could use the Ethernet between the base stations and, and have super fast backhaul so that you really weren't losing any bandwidth. Okay. And, so I uh, can s – yes. So they were great right. units and they still made a version 2 that was a pro model that in the pro system had those Ethernet ports on it. So it was all in all good hardware. People liked the app. When it worked, it worked brilliantly, although there were some user complaints about how sometimes it wasn't working well at all. But for the most part, people who had them were very happy. And in the areas that I tested it, I have a, I have a test house that I use. It's a friend's house. <laughs> he has oh, a – Oh, you're really... serious. Sorry. Okay. I, no, my, I didn't my... want to imagine that. But okay. yeah, yes. no, Well, you imagine Victor having two homes, one solely for testing Wi-Fi. That's what you imagine. <laughs> Why not? But okay. yeah, because we all do, don't we? I mean, seriously, no. My, no, I'm uh, waiting for one in blue before I e commit. But exactly, no. You go my to your friend. He's he's <laughs> got a house. He's got a home, and his home is modestly sized. But due to the nature of the construction in the home, downstairs in the kitchen area and off in the living room where the telly is, get no signal, and there's a big black hole. And I mapped the signal using my my MacBook, and I walked around and I took readings in all the corners of the rooms and where the TV is, and it's visible. There is a black hole of signal distribution there. It just doesn't reach. And Your friend did understand what you were doing as you were oh, yeah. walking around oh, yeah. his or her yep. house. Okay, yep. right. And okay. just so. You know, you know, we, we saw that there was no signal in this area, and then we plugged in the Eero system. We plugged in various, uh, various other systems because I go there to test everything. But um, we plugged in the Eero system, and it was very quick to set up, not a whole lot of steps in the app, and it just worked, and it solved the problem. And the difficulty is that with Eero now owned by Amazon, 
you have to worry about a they can intercept all of your traffic yes they they can see every type of device that you have on your network now for a company that sells devices might that information be valuable you are assuming that just because they could it means they would and i'm a little bit shocked at you a little bit tiny bit I, I think when we talk about risk, we have to talk about what the potential vulnerabilities are, not just what's been practically demonstrated. Okay. That sounds fair. Yes. And so this is what we're talking about is what is the potential now that Amazon's purchased them? And, you know, we, we could similarly say that they, are, they could consider to integrate Alexa into it. Now, the era already kind of worked with Alexa in that you could turn on guest Wi-Fi or set parental controls kind of things just on and off by voice. Um, I, I think I remember that it allowed to do that, but they could do more. They could put an Alexa in every router because then suddenly, you know, it has the Wi-Fi and you have them around your home. Why wouldn't you want them around if you were all in on Alexa? Yeah, one well, absolutely. There are some people that are very creeped out by Alexa. So it, yeah. it makes sense to be possibly creeped out by that potential. Um, okay. I mean, if it comes down to massive companies beginning with A, I would – I think it's interesting. I automatically – I'm suspicious of Amazon, which feels uh, not only wrong of me, but also potentially legally wrong of me. But, you know, just, yeah. Uh, whereas I find I trust Apple and uh, really in practice, you shouldn't trust anybody with this, can you? I just, I remember well, the days when you'd have to think about your I router. I mean, no, you do. Unless, unless you're building your own router and unless you're building your own firmware for the Wi Fi chip, at some point you're trusting someone. Mm. You know, e even if you are downloading an open source firmware like OpenWRT or DDWRT and flashing your router with your own firmwares, unless you've audited that code, at some point you're trusting someone. You're trusting the developers who put that code together, right? So we don't have infinite amounts of time. We don't have the ability or, or capabilities of auditing every piece of code we run. So you end up trusting someone. And you you probably, like I, feel that it's okay to trust Apple, especially since Tim Cook makes such an issue of grandstanding on privacy. Yes. Yeah. He has and certainly the planted the flag the in the FBI. ground and said, this is what we stand for. This is how we're going to do things. So you kind of trust that. And, and I do too. And in the absence of the airport routers, the question becomes, who do you trust? And, and for my own network, I've chosen to trust Synology because they've been very quick about security updates. They've been, been very quick about making a system that is powerful both in terms of Wi-Fi signal and dispersion as well as configurability. And, and it works for me. And it also is compatible with Apple's time machine, which is nice. And it does this mesh thing that uh, – Eero seemed to make itself synonymous with mesh stuff, but there are others. And is this one of them, Synology? There are does? several others. And Synology does have mesh as well. They have uh, – they, they started out with their initial router, the uh, RT2600 AC. Well, it's their second version, but it's the good one. And they've just this January added uh, MR2200 AC as their mesh routing system that you can just buy add-on modules separately to go ahead and, and create your mesh. And are they all sort of much of a muchness, really? It's mesh or it isn't? Yeah. So there are – there is no mesh standard yet with which manufacturers must comply. They got to all roll their own. Right. And so what will eventually happen, I suspect – is that there will become a mesh standard and manufacturers will end up complying with it. And so at some point, we'll see a situation where everyone's mesh nodes are more or less compatible. You buy from one and then you buy from another manufacturer and you just add them together kind of thing. That may take place. Plug them together as you see. Okay. But it has yes. not yet. It is not It's not a current thing. And uh, so currently, if you're buying in one system, you have to buy within that manufacturer's silo. I'm less fussed about that than I might be. I, I, yeah, that's not a big I issue. I see the benefits, but um, yeah, being able to just buy the nearest one to you, the cheapest one to you, the best deal at the moment, knowing it will all work together, that's a, a nice goal to aim for. But I think I just I would like Apple to come back into airports, please, and, and make me a nice mesh thing for me, just for me. That'd be fine. Yeah, and, and of course, the other thing that's been missing since Airport went away is the lack of the small router with the audio jack on it, right? The, okay. the Airport Express has the audio jack on it and works with AirPlay, got updated for AirPlay 2 and appears in HomeKit. And so they, they bothered enough to let the one guy on the janitorial staff update the firmware for that. 
right? right? The last the last guy out, turn out the lights kind of thing. But try and find a replacement for that. You can find replacement routers for the Airport Extreme. You can find replacements for Time Capsule, kind of, right? You, mm. you, you know, you can find replacements for all those things. But what is the good one that has the audio jack? There isn't. What is the good one with an audio jack do that I don't get from having a router somewhere else and, and a beloved home pod? Well, so the the goal is have your good speak you know, your good speakers miss you. Use your good speakers. Your good speakers miss you is the tagline for the original Griffin twenty. And HomePod is an excellent speaker. But there are better speakers in the world. And if you have those better speakers, they should be airplay too, shouldn't they? Now you can you can accomplish that either by doing a ridiculously expensive receiver that will also eventually have airplay two in it. But it would be really nice to be able to just do something like this. Okay. Um, I, I, anyway. Accepting the fact that money is obviously an object, if yeah. you really needed that, you could buy a Mac Mini because that's got a headphone jack and uh, just litter your house with Mac Minis. Um, yeah, but there's a reliability and, and systems update kind of thing there too. Never mind energy the Mac consumption. Mac Mini isn't reliable. I'm uh, saying that because it runs an operating system that is user accessible, then you need to tend to it from time to time. Okay. I just also feel it's a little bit expensive to chuck away uh, yeah. in a corner to play music yes. every other day. Yes. So yeah. I see the issue there. How did we get onto this? We don't trust well, Amazon. We got onto this because we don't trust Amazon. And at the same right. time, so Apple got out of making Wi Fi because they felt like they'd accomplished all they could accomplish. There was nothing more to do. Ever. It was commodity. Now, you have to remember when they came into it, Wi-Fi was very new. Yeah. And, you know, you could buy an Aeronet router from Cisco and go to Cisco school and get an engineering degree to learn how to set it up. <laughs> right. Yes. Or, you know, there, there, there weren't a lot of good competitors. I got one from Buffalo Tech way back when and was able to set it up. And, and of course, the early Linksys were okay. But they weren't nearly as easy if, if you were an Apple customer and had the airport. Okay. And uh, so, so they proved that you could make a good user interface that was simple, that allowed people to have control over the things they needed to have control over without going too far. And in fact, they dumbed the interface down over time. You know, the, the old airport application, airport utility five version five gave you control towards all kinds of things, including hours that you could set access for some devices, a sort of rudimentary parental control. And all of that kind of went away when they updated to the app based uh, version after that. So so Apple proved that you could make it simple and they felt like they proved all they could prove and they got out. And the question is, is there room for them to get back into it with mesh routing? And is it room because it needs to be simple or is it room because the others aren't trustworthy? My mind stood on the idea of Apple getting out because they've done all they can. That feels too much like they have bequeathed Wi-Fi safety to the world and have now left town to sort out problems elsewhere. When presumably it just meant that uh, it was such a commodity item, everybody else was making them, they weren't selling enough. In oh, which absolutely. case, I don't see that that's changed. Yeah. Um, the security aspect, I think, is interesting. Um, can Apple stand up and say they're the most secure if... Uh, Amazon's version of Eero is dominates the world, and every Mac is plugged into one. Um, no, but can they do anything about it other than? I mean, it's obviously not a trivial thing just reopening an entire hardware line. Um, well, I mean, I'm, you certainly have to put time and people on it, kind of thing. Now, Amplify, who is a subsidiary of Ubiquity, makes a consumer level router that comes with what they call a teleport system. And, and basically, it's the main router that lives in your home and then a small one that you travel with. And when you travel, you connect to it either by Wi-Fi or Ethernet. And it, um, it goes ahead and VPNs back to the home for you so that you're at least as secure as you were at your house. Yes, I see that, um, which is a nice thing um, generally. Okay. Yeah. So, so there are, I think, there, there is a need for greater security. There is a need for greater privacy. I, I would say that maybe what Apple could do is set up their own VPN service that you then run on your devices. And that shields you from whatever else people want to do with their routers. That, uh, to my mind, that sounds quicker and simpler, but also harder sell explaining it to people. And I think sales are going to be the thing here because well, even though you can buy all these different 
uh, options, it's going to come down to, for the majority of people, it's going to be the one that's advertised on Amazon. I wonder which one that will be. Or yeah. the one that's on sale at the App Store, Apple Store next to the Mac you're buying. Well, Those and this was, this was hilarious, ones. actually, because in, in part of Amazon's justification for purchasing Euro, in their announcement that says we're buying Euro, they said it got great Amazon reviews. It had 4.6 stars on Amazon. Right. <laughs> they I bought it because bit. it scored highly in their own stuff. Well, I've often bought things because they were – no, I haven't. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, should we I mean, it's one thing to, to buy the, the product, but but my God, to buy the whole company. because That's like when Google bought oh. Motorola, you know. I, you, you, you sort of envision Larry Page saying, I need a new phone. Go buy me a Motorola. And they come back and, yes, we bought Motorola, the company. You did what? Oh, <laughs> oh there's such a famous – example of this i cannot remember uh, it would have been 60s 70s 80s some really rich guy saying i like the company the product so much i bought the company remington, that was their big... remington, remington. thank you yeah. yes oh that would have been driving me spare that would be thank you yes okay i'm also minded of a company i worked in where somebody ordered uh, a lot of powerpoints uh, they needed some mains extension cables and wondered why all this software came back with a massive bill but, Whoops. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because that's a unique term. We don't call PowerPoints uh, extension cables. No, I mean, I don't know if it happens in America, but in Britain, we, we there has been a time when you would speak to the socket on the wall as a PowerPoint. So it was not completely un understandable uh, that this happened, but it was. Yeah. It took a certain set of problems. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very, yes. very time limited kind of joke and regional limited joke. Yeah. Okay, I feel put in my place. Now that we've gone ahead and put that one in his place. All right. (laughs) Here's one you can really speak to, William. So tell me about the the Apple News service. It it looks as if Apple signed up a bunch of publications to an upcoming subscription news service. Yes, that's about it. Um, Well, there's a detail there that I'm waiting to hear your opinion on because I expect it to be loud and, and well thought out. Well, I hope it's well thought out. Thank you for saying that. I don't know how loud it is. I've been thinking about this a great deal. Uh, we believe, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, that at least the majority of deals that Apple has been doing with publishers will see Apple keeping half of the revenue. So we're already well, well familiar with Apple having 30% of App Store sales and uh, iTunes things and all sorts of stuff. Uh, now it's 50%. And... I'm kind of going nuts over this because there's part of me that thinks that's Apple being really quite bold and saying this is going to make a lot of money for everybody. And I could see publishers actually being tempted into it because Apple is doing that. But on the other hand, this is such a delicate decision for publishers anyway. I think 50% feels too much for me. It's just, it's like I hit a pain point for it and i i mean doubtless say i'm I'm wrong apple has not come to my door and tried to sell me on all the things apple hasn't shown me what figures they've calculated for all of this and i know they have a nice shiny keynote presentation that says it's all going to be great but i think when people think about this apple asking for 50 percent, we tend to regard that as uh like a closed system and actually it's much more than that because uh Yes, that's what goes on with Apple. But if I, as a publisher, choose to go with Apple, I am also choosing uh, to not have people come straight to me. It's not an even decision one way or the other. But if I am on Apple, then some people who might have subscribed to me directly will go via Apple to get the cheaper deal. Um, How I work out the odds of that. Anybody who signs up to Apple to read me who wasn't going to subscribe is a bonus anybody who doesn't subscribe is obviously a loss and trying to work out that balance is terribly hard and i would say impossible i think it's ultimately always going to be a guess but the good thing is it is a problem and an issue that completely vanishes if this new service is as much of a success as say apple music money changes everything and yeah publishers will be happy my my concern is you know i don't know that the Apple News app on iOS and on Mac has a lot of uptake in terms of readership or or how it's doing in terms of pe- outlets being happy that they're on it. The uh, Apple obviously does have a sense of that. But my thought has been that it hadn't been well adopted. My thought as a publisher would be I would be very skeptical of doing this with with Apple because in the past, 
you know, news organizations went ahead and put themselves on Facebook and they put stories on Facebook and things like this. And what happens anytime you go to someone else's platform is that you lose control. You lose control over your own. I mean, certainly you can publish whatever you want, but if all of your readers have left your outlet to go view at this other portal, then then you've given everything up. Yes, I mean the Facebook case. Well, in any case, that's, that's any the problem with you YouTube, for that matter, is that creators have lost all control because they've given all their power to YouTube. I should say also there is another issue for publishers very specifically to this one, uh, this case, in that uh, as far as we know, Apple is continuing its policy of not giving these companies any information about the users who purchase for them. And, you know, uh, the famous examples of software developers, uh, this has changed now, but they used to look at the App Store and there's somebody complaining about their app and they're complaining about the stupidest thing. They're saying that happens with podcast reviews, isn't a camera. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and developers couldn't uh, they couldn't complain that uh, somebody was criticizing the wrong app they more urgently maybe they couldn't help somebody who was asking a question on there and that's been sorted out in redesigns and things but still that lack of ability to connect with your own audience um, you're ceding control and it's, it's a huge thing what happens if facebook or apple or the other decide to go to 60 percent or 70 or just decide not to promote you this week uh it's a terrible thing which could be great the numbers were sorted out and i I hope it's a success because i wanted newsstand to be a success until i used it and just found it a bit clunky and ugly and genuinely forgot that i'd even subscribed to anything yeah you get on with the news application any better Yes, actually, uh, quite a lot. Occasionally on my Mac, but quite often uh, on iOS. It tends to be that a link takes me to it rather than my going to the app first. But then once I'm in there, I tend to go off reading all sorts of other things. And I I keep meaning to switch off uh, news alert notifications from it. But the ones that come through tend to be so interesting, I, I'll, I'll switch it off later. So I get the odd little nudge to read. Nice. It's, Very nice. It's, yeah, I, I like it, actually. I'm, I'm not a fan. I wouldn't miss it particularly. I'm very curious to know how they'll make that divider between what's free and what you pay for, how clear that is. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, probably after March the 25th, if rumours can be believed. Yeah, so March the 25th is said to be the next big Apple event. And I don't know that there will actually be any hardware announced. Rumour is that actually no there won't be. Rumour is that the new service will be the thing. And a lot of people are saying that this is when Apple will finally reveal its videos service. And they're saying that um, partly because there are apparently some signs that point to it, but also uh, it looks likely that Apple will launch that in April. So when else are they going to uh, announce this? I I, I don't know. Uh, we've run a feature on Apple Insider, basically running the numbers on this, because uh, it seems to me if Apple does no hardware... Well, fine. Disappointing. I want a new iPad. And please, iMacs. I'm waiting for a new iMac. Uh, If it's news and video, then I think effectively it's just video. Because you look at all the people they've got uh, on the video service. I mean, everybody from JJ Abrams to Oprah Winfrey and stars and crew and cast in between. Amazing people. Whenever this is launched, they are going to be out on that stage. And I just think, and here's Oprah Winfrey is going to totally outshine and here's wired uk on the news platform uh, so will they put them together will they launch i'm yeah, fascinating but the, the the consistent thing we're hearing is that it's unlikely that there'll be um hardware or at least specific hardware people are saying the airpods 2 uh, are more likely to be at the end of the year and i think that makes sense and right. i have my current airpods so i'm fine i know when, i know what you're really waiting for though the iMac. I keep saying it to you. Yes. I was going to go with air power. Oh, air power. Yes. Well, there is a story uh, that that is so close to release now that Apple is at this moment filming some of its whizzy TV adverts for it. Um, I just, I don't know. Can you see it uh, on March the 25th? If that yeah. is the correct date. Not, not alongside Apple. the video service. Although in the past, when they've launched big services like Apple Music, they launched all the hardware. And then at the end, here's the big thing about music. But with yeah. this, I, I, I don't know. I mean, 
To make a whole event out of a TV service, you kind of think, how do they stretch 45 minutes out of that? How do they stretch two hours out of that? Oh, very easily. This is Apple. Come on. I'm just thinking uh, Apple uh, championing its news service, Apple heralding its video service, and then Apple saying, oh, and here's that charging mat we promised in 2017. Yes. That just doesn't. <laughs> Yay. So this story doesn't work there, does it? But yeah, oh. Apple does release things through press releases. I mean, they did that quite a quite a substantial macbook update last uh june july time and that I mean, was just a little press release here's here's it. how i would think about it right if if the rumor has been that there are new ipads coming yes for example and maybe why not a new apple tv because it's been a year not that it has to be but or two years even but why not right show off the tv app on these applications, on, on these devices. Here we have this fancy new iPad. It's really great. And by the way, remember that TV app we showed you about a few years ago? We'd like to tell you about it again. And let's dive because right into the TV now? app. And okay. over here, it works brilliantly. You hold your tongue. Uh, no, you I hold your fork stick- tongue, William. Yeah, that tongue is going in a different direction at the moment. But okay. yeah, yes, so, I know you like this, and you know I don't. Right, but, but they'll fix it. Give them, give them the hardware to talk about. Give them the application to talk about. Give them a new Apple TV to talk about. Segue into the service from there. I could see an event that worked like that, and ends with them saying, "Oh, and by the way, we've got the Washington Post." Yeah, mm. the the strength of rumor apparently is that. The new service is going to be the highlight of this. Uh, and I really, I just don't <sighs> see it. I don't but, see it. Uh, but, you know, I'm not in the know with this. Um, interesting times. I mean, we, we live in a time where the news services are regularly attacked more than they have been in the years past. Yes. And, and news services being attacked has been ramping up over the last, let's say, 30 years. But, but now we've sort of reached what I would think of as the peak of that. And it is um, difficult for me to see it making sense to launch the news service as a whole event of its own. Like you're going to drag all of these these people out to California. Here's your news service. Uh, mm. Yes, it's a critical problem that, that Facebook have been trying to address, that others have been trying to address. How do you save news? How do you save journalism in an age where print is going away and where advertising dollars are diminishing? You know, and, and also as a side note to that, that people don't really talk about a lot. How do you save local news? How do you save local journalism where there never has been a whole lot of money in it anyway? Right? These are difficult questions. But it's it's weird that you'd have a whole event about that and a whole event from Which Apple about that. Which makes you think it's news plus and who knows what the plus is. So yeah. It could be IMAX. I, I'm crossing my fa- I don't think it's going to be IMAX. I don't know why, but mostly because I've been looking like a puppy at the screen at every keynote and every announcement, thinking, saying, please give me a new IMAX. Uh, have, I, have I been clear at all that I, I, I want a new IMAX? Uh, have I uh, conveyed that in any no. way? I'll be quieter no. about this. No, you have okay. not. Well, I have taken all your time. You are late for your next appointment. <laughs> I'm off to the Verve Poetry Festival in the UK. So I can very tell. Much looking forward to that. <sighs> I had some poetry jokes, but I've lost it. I was going to quote Robert Burns at you, but never mind. Um, Who? <laughs> Scottish poet. Right. Okay. You're assuming I'm... Uh, we sleek it to I'm more an Emily Dickinson know that fan. One? Oh. Okay. Um, Look I'm up here, Robert Who Burns. Who are you? Okay. Well, that's... <laughs> Come on. All right. We will be back next week with more Apple Insider podcast and more poetry reading from William. William, in the meantime, you can find Quoting Poetry online at william at appleinsider.com and W. Gallagher at Twitter, right? You can, and I have quoted poetry. Yes, so there. Yes. I'm Victor. I'll be quoting John Donne, and uh, I'm at vmarks on Twitter. We'll be back next week. See you, everybody. <laughs>